Hello, my name is Matt Levi, and I'm an assistant professor of soil science at the University of Georgia. I'm going to share some results where we're applying the R. Newhall model for dynamic soil survey interpretations of soil moisture. And I'd like to recognize my co authors, Grant Snicker, Rajendra Panda, and Kevin Machang. Most of us know that soil moisture information is really important as a soil property uh, for a variety of applications, including drought monitoring, uh, irrigation management. And we're now using soil moisture for wildfire prediction. Of course, we use soil moisture information for taxonomy and another uh, a variety of other different applications. One challenge with using soil moisture and obtaining it in the first place is that we have to install networks of soil moisture sensors that can get a little challenging with respect to time and financial constraints. So we use those networks as best we can, but we also rely a lot on uh, predictions of things like drought from meteorological data to represent soil moisture dynamics. So our objective was to develop a soil moisture prediction model with detailed spatial, temporal, and depth resolution to apply to different questions. In particular, we wanted to modify the original Newhall stimulation model or NSM to run in the R programming language to then improve estimates of soil moisture conditions in the profile and estimate moisture regimes um, from that data. So we're currently developing a package called R Newhall that can help us to implement daily soil moisture models as well as those original moisture regime classifications. So the Newhall simulation model is a simple water budget model that's used for monthly soil climate estimates. It's primarily been used as a soil moisture regime and a temperature regime uh, tool for assigning those categories. For more than 30 years, NRCS staff and other soil scientists have used the Newhall simulation model to do that. So this is an eight layer soil profile, relatively simple with cost layers that move water in and out of that profile. Currently, we have the Java Newhall simulation model, which provides outputs on a monthly time step for understanding when soil moisture is being utilized, a deficit, surplus, etc. So the first thing we've, we've done is to develop our code that will essentially do the same thing as the Java Newhall simulation model, uh, but being in the R framework allows for more flexibility. But the next thing we wanted to do was to modify this from a monthly time step to make it a daily soil moisture predictor. So to do that, we modified our soil grid to a 10 by 10 grid from that previous eight by eight. So you can imagine this as a soil profile where you have a surface at the top, the bottom of the soil profile is here. And then we have a continuum of, of dry to wet conditions represented by real uh, values of volumetric water content at the wilting point and at field capacity. These data are things that can come from uh, most soil databases, including Sergo. And then we've also added a saturated column that would be anything wetter than field capacity in that soil. So our inputs for uh, the drivers are coming primarily from gridded meteorological data. In this case, we're using PRISM data. Um, and our evapotranspiration information is coming from MODIS. So our study area is the Red River watershed, which is about 93,000 square miles. Uh, the mean annual precipitation ranges from about 17 inches in eastern New Mexico to the wetter portions in, in the eastern part of this uh, watershed, where we get up to 67 inches of precipitation. In terms of soil moisture regime, that translates to ustic aridic or aridic ustic moisture regimes in the west, all the way to eudic and then aquic moisture regimes in the east. So in order to use this model for daily predictions, we first test this on, on mesonet station data where we have measured soil moisture. And so these point-based estimates were used to really determine uh, initial conditions and how to kind of modify our new hall to make it a daily model. Here you can see data from one of these Oklahoma mesonet stations, the zero to 10 centimeter increment and the 20 to 30 centimeter depth. So you can see here, we have the black line as measured soil moisture from the mesonet station and the color line in both cases would be our model values from our new hall. For reference, you see field capacity and the wilting point as well to kind of know where we are in terms of volumetric water content. 
you can see from both of these plots that the modeled and measured values track pretty nicely. So that gave us, gave us some confidence to apply this model spatially. So to do that, we utilized the soil moisture active passive uh, remotely sensed data for volumetric water content in the root zone, in this case, zero to 40 centimeter depths. And we compared that to our R. Newhall output for volumetric water content at the same depth. We resampled the four kilometer predictions from our new hall to eight kilometer resolution of SMAP. So for each pixel, we have the ability to do a correlation coefficient for each of the days within the year 2016. That's what we're seeing here. So our correlation coefficient was strongest in the wetter portions of the study area, but somewhere around the five to 600 millimeter precipitation threshold, the correlation starts to get a bit weaker. This is a valuable way to explore the data, to see how the model's performing and know where the limitations may be. We also looked at temporal predictions of biometric water content from our new hall compared to SMAP in the same watershed for the same year. And in this case, we have 366 days of the year representing uh, different comparisons of correlation for uh, root zone data from SMAP and different slices of the soil profile. So zero to 100 centimeters, zero to 70, zero to 40, and then the surface shown in red. So what we can see is that the one-to-one the -one comparison of one, zero to one meter essentially has the strongest correlation between our new hall and the SMAP data. As we shave off the lower parts of the profile, our correlation becomes weaker and weaker until finally our surface comparison to the root zone product of Newhall uh, is a bit flashy and has low, much lower correlation coefficients. So again, this is valuable to kind of figure out where the limitations are, trying to make this a daily model. We then took the same um, approach to compare temporal predictions of, of our Newhall output to this time measured values. In this case, we used 34 of those mesonet stations from the Oklahoma mesonet uh, that uh, happened to land within the Red River Basin. You can see the distribution is uh, uh, shown here. And each of these plots represents the difference in volumetric water content uh, between measured values at station and the predicted values for that station for 34 stations. So the difference in volumetric water content, in this case, we have zero, which would indicate a perfect comparison. Um, because our average value, the colored line, is below zero, that means that our predicted values are a little high compared to the measured values. So that being said though, we have three years of data and we have the common trend here that we're just tending to be overpredicting um, up to 0.1 uh, biometric water content units. So, the, brings up the question now, do we really need volumetric water content or do we need moisture condition? So if we take one of these plots for one year and look at one point here, we can see volumetric water content predicted from our new hall. So we see some fluctuations across the year. Um, every soil is gonna have different ranges of volumetric water content based on texture and other properties. So what if we translate this volumetric water content into uh, a common, uh, variable, which would be fraction of available water, where we have the volumetric water content at a particular time divided by the total water holding capacity of that soil. So it's like the sponge of the soil, where a fraction of uh, available water equals volumetric water content at a certain time divided by field capacity minus wilting point. So that trans translates our data into a zero to one scale, where one is wet zero is dry, and now we can start to take this information and do something else with it. So we'll take that fraction of available water and start to then classify moist versus dry conditions. And so we can look at the changes in moist versus dry conditions now uh, across any given time period and start taking this to a number that's important for something like moisture regime classification. So we can get the number of consecutive days that are moist or dry and start applying this information to predict soil moisture regime. So we're currently developing an, an R package, as I mentioned, 
Uh, it's in the NCSS Tech GitHub repository as our new hall. And I'd like to especially um, thank Dylan Baudet for his help with the implementation of this model um, and developing the, the R package. So right now the classic version or that monthly version is, is almost finished. It will be functional very soon and getting into hands of those who might want to use it. We're continuing to uh, refine the enhanced version that will provide daily predictions of soil moisture and a lot more opportunity going forward to, to apply that data. And I'd like to indicate this is a good example of an NCSS partnership where a university partner such as uh, UGA can develop the beginning portions of a tool that could then be um, further developed and, and refined by NRCS staff and then really um, be complementary to both parties. Going forward, we recognize that some things need to be addressed like the redistribution of water, as you can see by this wetness index from Arizona, that whatever's in the rain gauge doesn't always mean that that much water is going into the soil. And once it gets in the soil, then we also recognize that not every soil behaves in the same way with respect to moisture redistribution. So thank you for your attention. I would like to acknowledge funding from USDA and RCS, uh, a cooperative agreement, and also from the U.S. Department of Interior South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center grant that helps support this work. Um, also contributions from colleagues Tyson Ochsner and Eric Kruger. Thank you very much.